Hey folks, welcome to Narratives. Narratives is a podcast exploring the ways in which the world is better than in the past, the ways it is worse, and the paths towards a better, more definite vision of the future. I'm your host, Will Jarvis, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. You can find show notes, transcripts, and videos at narrativespodcast.com. Well, Philosophy Bear, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? Quite good. Well, thanks for hopping on. Um, could you go ahead and give us a, a brief bio and some of the big things you're interested in? Yeah, sure. So I'm a PhD student. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I just started blogging at age 30 because I, I hadn't felt like I'd done enough with my life. And surprisingly, blogging actually helped with that. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've been writing ever since. Um, I've recently compiled some of my, uh, my essays into a book called Live More Lives Than One um, by Philosophy Bear. And uh, yeah, at the moment, uh, my interests are, are pretty numerous, but uh, stuff that I, I have touched upon in writing at various points include uh, mercy, religion, poverty, uh, over-incarceration, Marxism, welfare economics, metaphilosophy, uh, the analytic tradition in philosophy, and humanism. Um, my actual PhD research is on... Uh, the philosophy of welfare economics. Interesting. Um, well, Bear, I, I want to deviate a little bit. I, I hope that's okay. You know, how do you feel the difference between, you know, academic philosophy and, and blogging? You know, it, it's one a lot more rewarding. Uh, I know there's obvious things like, you know, you're not trying to publish it. Well, I guess you are, you're trying to publish, but you're not trying to get published in any journals when you blog. Um, but are there, are there big differences you found in, in how you approach it? If that makes sense. I think that's interesting. I was thinking about this the other day. Um, and I actually think that as a discipline, philosophy is probably closer to blogging than a lot of other traditions are, which is, which is not to say that they're uh, the same thing by any means. Um, like there's quite a gap, but, um, in philosophy, you know, there's like a great emphasis, particularly in analytic philosophy, um, in a kind of informal style, um, a kind of conceptual analysis, which is at, at, at once kind of light touch in terms of um, in in terms of in some ways in some ways light touch in a way that I find quite difficult to pin down, but in other ways um, it's also I guess quite down deep into a single concept or proposition um, and that that has quite a, a match with blogging I think you know one of my really close friends always says whenever you write uh, you write like you're having a fireside chat and he's, he's always telling me that's a huge problem for my PhD thesis which oh, no, it may I, well be I, I think but, that's important uh, for readability I think I think it helps with blogging, but doesn't necessarily help with academia. And and yet yeah, to come around, I think that philosophy is probably a bit closer than other disciplines uh, to blogging in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, uh, I guess the wacky incentives in academia propel things to be like uh, written in such a way that it's not you know super approachable, which I think is a is a, is a is a failing. It should be more like blogging in the sense that I think things should be more approachable. You know, uh, Clarence Thomas writes all the Supreme Court opinions so that anyone in America can read them. And I think yeah. approaches like that are, are important, right? Like it's better if things are more legible and, you know, just doing things just because it's formal seems like a bad, I don't know, approach. Yeah. Funnily enough, despite its terrible reputation in that regard, the legal profession seems to be ahead of academia or at least judges when they're writing their opinions when it comes to legibility. But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of academics want to write legibly, um, but they they're so immersed in their topics that they have trouble understanding what is and isn't legible um, because they don't they don't know where other people are coming gotcha. into the conversation. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah. So especially you know, there's this great quote about um, Immanuel Kant 
which is that he wrote precisely and exactly because he was writing precisely, he's almost impossible to read. And uh, I think that says something about academia in general, to be honest. I love that. I love that quote. Um, before we move on to the outline here, uh, you mentioned you know welfare economics. Are there big takeaways you found from your research that you know lay people might be surprised by that are that are kind of common knowledge within uh, philosophy around welfare economics? Um, I think that like something that a lot of people would be quite astonished by if they actually read up on the details would be cost benefit analysis. You know, people talk about cost benefit analysis in a quite informal way, but within economics itself, cost benefit analysis means something quite specific. Um, you know, the quantification of costs and benefits into monetary units, often in terms of like, um, surveyed or or more often inferred willingness to pay and uh, people would be quite astonished at the way political decisions are made using that i mean some people for example uh get really hung up on the idea of putting a cost on human life i'm i i sort of think that that's kind of just what you've got to do if you're making a decision which involves risk to human lives as a trade off, but I can understand why people are shocked by it. Myself, I'm shocked by the fact that implicitly, um, it means that infrastructure decisions are made through a kind of weighted voting process, um, which means that, um, which means that technically speaking, rich people have more votes than poor people on where bridges get built and uh, where the regulation is introduced and that sort of thing. So yeah, a lot of a lot of what I'm my starting point, although it's less of where I've ended up, was about a concern of the representation of inequality in cost benefit analysis. And I do think people would be would be stunned if they if they knew how this stuff is really done, both because it's kind of neat, but also because it's kind of well, frightening, to be honest. Yeah. Could you give an example of that, perhaps like like uh, in the minutia of like, you know, cost benefit analysis? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too polemical here. And of course, yeah. there's always the risk of like misrepresenting something. But like, let's say you're trying to decide whether to build a bridge, right? And you've got two locations, location A and location B. Now, location A um, is preferred by, I don't know, money, money bags, Von Monopoly man. Um, and uh, location B is uh, preferred by a small village full of people who all have uh, ailing mothers on the other side of the river, right? Um, right. Now, the people in the, in the small village, they're each willing to pay, let's say, $1,000 for the bridge to be built. And let's say there's 50 of them, so that's $50,000. Now, $1,000 for them is an awful lot of money. That, that represents, in fact, all of their savings. Other than that, they've only got... Uh, I don't know, pennies and lace or whatever, whatever these sort of Victorian peasants have. Um, and uh, the um, money bags mon von Monopoly man, he wants to get to the other side of the river more quickly because he's got it. I don't know, 3000 whole golf course there or something. Right. Yeah. And he's willing to pay, um, you know, a hundred thousand um, dollars to get it built there so that he can take his, his limo instead of his helicopter. Um, so because of the way, uh, cost benefit analysis works, you're going to build it where, uh, money bags prefers that it be built. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent this. Um, you know, there are people who say, well, actually this seems bad, but you know, there's, there's a positive side to it, which is that maybe we should do things this way. And then if we have concerns about inequality, redistribute through tax and transfer. Um, but I definitely think it's something that is in need of greater analysis. And I certainly don't think that it's something you can present as, as value free or value neutral, as some some authors have tried to do, or to suggest that it's somehow less value weighted than a more minimalistic cost benefit analysis. Does that does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I think that's an excellent example, and and I definitely think you're right. Like, it's not um, just just how important you know value it, values are, and they're just 
all things considered, it seems like, you know, you're really missing something if you ignore uh, the details of the situation. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's one of those things where really the public should have more to say about it. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of the debates are quite technical and even the method is quite technical. And I think a lot of people that hear cost benefit analysis and they just imagine like writing down a list of costs and benefits right. without necessarily quantifying it or, or whatever. But yeah, it's, it's a technical subject that I'm quite interested in. No, it's um, fascinating. That my PhD research is on. Yeah. It's fascinating just thinking about how technocrats, you know, make decisions like that and, and like, uh, the, the mechanics of it all. It, it's, uh, that's quite interesting. Um, do you consider yourself a Rawlsian or, you know, where do you come down on, on these kind of things? Um, so I, okay. So there's a couple of things to say about this. One is that, um, most of my research until I started doing my PhD in philosophy wasn't on normative topics at all. And gotcha. perhaps because of that, I have some slightly unusual takes on normative topics. Um, and I've really only done normative research in areas related to my PhD. So uh, I could be about to embarrass myself here, but I think that there's this idea in philosophy that there's a barrier between political philosophy and ethical philosophy. And I've always been quite skeptical of that. I've always thought that ethics um, should be seen as continuous with politics. And so the idea of, of using like a particular decision making procedure for politics, like a original position, um, doesn't really make sense to me unless it's seen in a whole of society context in terms of creating a whole ethics or gotcha. a whole way of relating to other people, whether through politics or not. Um, and in that regard, um, I do have some sympathy for the original position argument, but um, I think that um, I buy Hassani's argument on it, which is that in the original position, uh, you wouldn't actually decide on the min-max principle, which is the idea that you make the worst person in society the best off they can be. Rather, what you would decide is that um, you would want um, to maximize the overall well-being of society. So I think Hassani is right that a careful analysis of the original position actually leads to utilitarianism. Um, and so I would say in political philosophy, I'm broadly a utilitarian. And this is where what I came up earlier uh, where I mentioned earlier that I'm a little bit skeptical of the idea of a divide between ethics and political philosophy comes in because most people wouldn't consider utilitarianism a uh, position in political philosophy. Uh, but I, I, I think that that's really my starting point in political philosophy, um, strange and paradoxical as that may sound. Um, but I'm also a little bit it's a bit off topic from your question, but I'll also throw out there, I, also, I do have some doubts about utilitarianism. Like, I think um, the kind of logical conclusion of utilitarianism is that we should probably tile the universe with, you know, uh, sort of beings that are experiencing moments of bliss over and over again. Right. And you can sort of retool this to um, any sort of uh, utilitarianism. You can make it work for preference utilitarianism. You can make it work for hedonic utilitarianism. So on the whole, I think um, in a practical everyday sense, I'm drawn towards utilitarianism, but the real truth is probably a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, uh, but I'm definitely, definitely with Asani on the on the original position. I don't think you can get Rawls's uh, difference principle from that at all. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And would you consider yourself kind of? Are you interested in effective altruism at all? I am interested in it. Um, I haven't like dug really deep into it. Um, I, I've got a lot of friends who are interested in it to varying degrees, um, and you know, when I give money personally, I do try to uh, you know look up the various uh, charity aggregators that are online and, uh, you know, work out which of the various malaria charities it is. <laughs> right. Um, Cause it's always malaria. Yeah. Uh, it, it's always, it always nets. Turns, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in it, but I, I can't say that I know a great deal about it. I would gotcha. say. 
Yeah, that makes sense. This is a great segue to our our next question. Uh, this is the one of the, this is like the second essay I read of yours, and I really quite uh, I found it quite interesting. Uh, death, you know, how bad is it? I know that's kind of like a that's quite the question, right? But yeah, so as I think you're alluding, like there's this old philosophical debate about whether or not death is actually bad for you. And, uh, you know, it goes along the lines of, well, since you don't really exist anymore, how can you be harmed by it? I find it, I've always found that debate uh, tremendously boring. Um, and I've, I've always thought that, you know, it's, it's really an attempt to pull the metaphysical trick, right? Like, I, I don't think you can metaphysics your way out of uh, your position on death or into a position on death. I think um, it's it's a question of values. Um, and in that regard, yeah, I mean, I, I do think death is, is quite harmful um, in that, uh, or at least uh, involuntary death. And, uh, you know, I, I think we should try to stop it. Uh, to the degree that we can. And in this, I'm very much uh, inspired by uh, Nikolai Fedorov, Fedorovich. Um, uh, he had this idea that death is actually a form. He, he was a Russian um, philosopher in the early 20th century. And he had this idea that death is actually a form of alienation between people in terms of how it plays out. So when when someone's dead, right, um, it's like the ultimate, like think about social atomization, right? That's yeah. that's an incredible form of um, alienation, right? But death is just that on steroids, right? It's a complete gap between people, um, a total divide. Right. And I guess that's one of the things I find most objectionable about it. Um, now, Nikolai Fedorovich, um, who, who I wrote that essay on, um, has this idea of, well, what this necessitates from us is a kind of overall social task of trying to abolish death, which, you know, many transhumanists have proposed, but he went a little bit further than most people in saying that we need to make the abolition retrospective. We need to find a way to raise everyone who has ever died from the dead. Now, of course, he didn't have the foggiest idea how to do this. And uh, it's it's really not clear that there is a way to do it. But um, such was the intensity of his, I guess, moral objection to, to death and the alienation um, that, that came with it, that I think he thought that we needed to basically dedicate our civilization to trying to find a way to do it. Um, now, there's a question, you know, is that chasing, making a whole civilization chase after a delusion? And possibly yes, but I just find as an idea, his whole framework of trying to abolish death and, and the abolition of death as the highest task of humanity, something interesting to think about, like a kind of philosophical fiction or, or narrative from which to sort of look at our world from the outside and, you know, maybe make a resolution to do what we can about death, even if a, a retrospective abolition is impossible. Definitely, definitely. I, I think it's, um, it was a really interesting thing to think about, you know, it's something um, I've reflected on within the past couple of months. It's like, you know, in, in the, in the Bible, you know, Jesus comes, you know, comes back and there's this great resurrection of everyone. And I, I wonder if that's a parable for like technology eventually, like, you know, what if we find a way to bring everyone back? And this is uh, uh, perhaps some fulfillment of this prophecy. Anyway, wacky idea I have. My, but I guess my question is, is um, it, you talked about a couple of different ways this might particularly happen, you know, like maybe we collect information from light that's traveled out in the universe and we can see what had gone on and, and we can. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I just stop you there to quickly say that these are kind of i'm not in any way proposing that this is plausible these are just right. science fiction ideas that you know i explore in the context of the, of the essay so i no no definitely. claims being made here no yeah no, they, no scientific they, they, going on it would definitely be um, uh you know thousands of years away and uh, physics would have to change or our understanding of it or something but um, yeah yeah quite interesting to think about uh how should we think about the value of of 
people that have already passed away versus potential future people. Yeah. So this is, I think, one of the other areas in which uh, I find my utilitarianism challenged um, in that I find something a little bit objectionable about the idea that creating new people to replace people who are lost uh, would be just as good from the point of view of the universe. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it is an interesting, interesting question. Um, and I think that this is probably pretty close to the bedrock of philosophical intuitions. Like either you have this sense that, um, we have a duty to those who have passed or, or you don't. Um, but I do think that like, there's, there's something very impoverished um, in, and this is an old objection to utilitarianism that I, I take quite seriously, but there's something very impoverished in your life if you take people as potential replacements for other people, if you ignore the specificity of your relationships with them. Um, and there's a richness to human life um, that is lost, I think, um, if, if, you, if you view a replacement as playing the role of the original, right? Because every every human relationship is unique and specific in a way that I think that misses. Um, but it is a fascinating question. Just circling back around um, to the to the technological stuff. Yeah. One thing I would throw out there as a kind of precondition, almost certainly for any kind of technological. Uh, resurrection of the dead is that you have to have a certain view of personal identity. Oh, um, yes. So you have to think that um, in order for a person to, you know, potentially be brought back to life after their body has decayed and gone everywhere, you have to think that what it means to be, you know, Bob, who's the same Bob as the Bob who lived a thousand years ago, is to have, you know, similar mental states, similar personality, similar memories, etc. If you think what it means to survive um, is to have the same body or be a continuous body, which some philosophers do, then other than some, you know, very, very far flung scenarios, it's it's hard to see how any kind of resurrection would be would be possible. So this is one of my the reasons I'm so interested in this as a philosophical vision is that um, so many different questions from so many different areas of philosophy keep intersecting with it. Um, you know, and I think it'd be a great way to teach an undergrad course in philosophy, actually, like you just go through all the different problems or, or philosophical conundra that arise in, in the, in the context of, of this vision of, you know, what if we found a way to try and bring back everyone who ever lived back to life? Yeah, definitely. I, there's so many levels and then, you know, like, um, you know, do we bring back the bad people? You know, it's, do Hitler and Stalin deserve to be brought back? You know, like yeah. all these different things. And I think that that says something very interesting about you as a person, um, right? Um, both whether you think that they should be brought back and once they are brought back, whether you think that it's essential or necessary to punish them. Um, and I'm not saying necessarily... Um, you know, myself, I'm I'm always a, a pro mercy guy, big believer in mercy for pretty much everyone. But um, I don't think necessarily it says anything bad about you if you disagree. But I think it's it's interesting to think about, and that's a a great way, as you say, to frame another philosophical problem. You know, the problem of the uses and value of punishment. Definitely, definitely. I I'm curious, how much do you think? our moral intuitions are just inbuilt at some genetic level. And how much do you think it's just like an environmental and where do you come down on this? So I'm, I'm not an anthropologist. Um, but one thing I do think is that a lot of these discussions about human nature are, are missing the anthropological perspective. Um, and personally, I think that a close attention to the anthropological literature, which I've only paid to a very limited degree, but nonetheless, uh, suggests that the answer's got to be both. I wrote an essay once on Peter of Abelard, who was uh, who was a um, 
medieval philosopher. Um, and uh, he has this case study where he describes uh, a very, a very, very cruel slave master, or I think slave master or, or, or servant keeper, I'm not sure which translation is better, but in any case, um, he mistreats, um, he mistreats his slave and, and then the slave, uh, fearing for his life, actually, so not just to escape mistreatment, but fearing for his life, kills the slave master. Um, now, Peter Abelard says unequivocally that this is morally wrong, that you've got no right to do this. Um, but what's kind of interesting about it is that in the context of saying this, he's very clear that what the slave master has done is wrong, the slave doesn't deserve to die, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's always these threads of continuity and change. Um, but I think overall, yeah, I mean, the basic seeds of a concern for all other human beings are within all humans. Um, but at the same time, we shouldn't underestimate how those seeds grow under different conditions. And I think that there's got to be some truth to Peter Singer's expanding circle thesis um, that over time we've gotten better and better at caring about a larger and larger range of people. Definitely. And there's, there's a great study I'll have to send to you, um, about moral, the moral circle. And, uh, they did, they surveyed, uh, people all across the political spectrum and the most conservative people, uh, had extreme in-group preference for their families. Um, and at the farthest extremes of, um, on the left, people had uh, a slightly higher um, preference for taking care of like, you know, everybody like it, it and it, even non-living, uh, sorry, sorry, non-human animals as well. So it's interesting, like there's, there's this like political divide aspect to it. And then also it's like, um, you know, I also had this question whether as we get richer, we're able to care for more things. And it is, is it just something as we get wealthier as a society, we're more able to be kind to wider things. And so we kind of do that. Yeah, yeah. Partly it is opportunity. Um, although there are always these extraordinary tales of compassion from, um, from people who are in the least position to to give it. Um, right. you know, I, I wrote this uh, essay recently on on Jesus, actually, on my blog that you might have seen Jesus considered from a, a secular perspective. And, um, you know, in there, he has this story of the widow's might of this widow who gives basically the equivalent of a few cents, but it's all that she's got, right. And that is that that's not just a story, like there are so many, so many tales of that are, are well verified of people who are living in absolutely marginal conditions, often after a massive natural disaster or something like that, who nonetheless give everything in 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 certain ways. Um, yeah, I, so it, it's it's complicated. I think that there are some senses in which you can care for more people as you get richer, um, and there are other senses in which you don't. And I think there's a complex interplay there that. It's like so many things you could spend a lifetime studying it, but you know, you've only got one. Right. right. And, and you might not admit it like this, but uh, I almost mean it as, as the entire society, you know, it, what, the, yeah. as we have more material yeah. wealth, generally, we're able to, you know, distribute it in more ways. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's, I guess as the pie gets bigger, there's necessarily more ways of carving it, right? You know, right. Um, but at the same time, we also we we don't perceive the pie as getting bigger because more and more things become necessary. And this is why you often get this. I find it fascinating when you talk with with Westerners. You say, you know, like, well, you know, throughout most of history, people have lived on the equivalent of much less than a dollar a day. Could you do that? And they can't even. It's not even that they think, oh, that'd be horrible. It's that they literally cannot imagine how the maths would add up. It's so right. interesting. Definitely. Do, do you find you have a unique perspective on the West living, you know, in Australia? You know, you're literally all the way across the globe, globe from where I am right now in the United States. Do you think that gives you kind of a unique, like a, a somewhat outside perspective? Or is it still like fairly internal, you think? Um. I mean, maybe a little bit more external than 
uh, say the UK. Um, but I would still say it's more internal in many ways than say places outside the Anglosphere like Germany right. or, or, or France, right? Um, we don't even have a separation of language. So there's a real cultural closeness there. And, you know, so much of what's on TV is either British stuff or American stuff. Right. So it all um, kind of blends together. Yeah, yeah, it, it is interesting. I mean, I think even if you look at Australian Twitter, right, like a lot of people follow uh, US politics quite closely, uh, precisely because there is that when you're a smaller place, there there is that magnetism. I can only imagine what it's like in New Zealand, right, which is even smaller still. So, you know, it's not quite large enough to have like a, its own closed cultural circle. Right. Um, yeah, so different, I'm sure, in some ways, but it's hard for me to pinpoint how. I'd gotcha. Say. That makes yeah. sense. Um, you mentioned Jesus. Religious culture and and OCD, you know, how do you think they're related? Yeah, so um, I wrote an essay once on this. Um, I have, I'm a lifetime sufferer of OCD. I have uh, quite severe OCD and um, that's, and I was raised or uh, religious, although I'm no longer religious. And um, so one of the things I became interested in quite early um, was the idea of a relationship between obsessive compulsive disorder and religion. Now I should, I should probably clarify what I mean by a relationship here. So what I'm thinking about is not exactly the idea that the great religious prophets had OCD or something like that. Um, although I think in some cases that's quite possible. Like if you look at Martin Luther, for example, he shows uh, a lot of the classical symptoms of OCD. And it is interesting that he is, you know, one of the few founders of a religion, Protestantism, who, you know, is close enough in time for us to see that. So who knows, maybe some of the other founders also had uh, uh, OCD features. But um, I should also say just before I dive into this, that after I wrote uh, my essay on this, I found out that a guy uh, called Saplosky, um had hmm done similar work. So I, I don't I don't want to try and steal his thunder or, or claim that I'm the only person who's uh, interested in this connection. But um, yeah, so I, I look at a number of different uh, relationships uh, or potential relationships between OCD and uh, religion. And, you know, that includes uh, stuff like um, one of the first points of similarity is the idea of purity and the fear of contamination. So the idea of purity and ritual purity is something that occurs in numerous religions. The ones that I'm most familiar with um, are the Abrahamic religions. Um, it occurs in all of those religions except some forms of Christianity. And um, the idea that uh, something can become impure quite e easily but is made pure with great difficulty um, is something that, that reoccurs. Um, so, and, and there's this kind of creeping paranoia or searching for new ways uh, to rule out the possibility of something becoming impure. So I give the example of the classic Talmudic reasoning about, um, about mixing uh, meat and dairy products. So um, in the Talmud, it's inferred um, that you shouldn't mix uh, meat and dairy products for the reason that it mentions in the Torah uh, three times uh, don't uh, mix a kid goat in its mother's milk, right? And so they they thought to themselves, well, we'd understand what this meant if they just said it once, but they've repeated it three times. There must be a reason why they've repeated it three times, right? And so there's this elaborate sequence of Talmudic reasoning that I won't go into now, by which they basically arrive at the conclusion that it must be because they don't want you to mix meat and milk at all, right? Right. And for me, if you look at the kind of fear logic of people with OCDs, where they come up with these increasingly convoluted stories about how things could be contaminated, that got kind it. of echoes that. Um, so we've also got, what else have we got? We've got um, a fear of offending the sacred, right? So there's this form of um, OCD, which is called scrupulosity OCD. And in scrupulosity OCD, people have this concern um, that they're going to do something 
um, that will offend God or, or a spirit or something like that. And often this is, you know, thinking blasphemous thoughts or muttering blasphemous words or something like that. And they become very concerned about that. And I had this idea, okay, well, generally speaking, we'd think that this is downstream of religion, right? Like you live in a society where this happens. Right. And um, uh, you, uh, you have a religious belief and so your OCD manifests in this way. But I thought, what if you actually inverted that? What if the idea of the sacred, of this omnipresent thing, which you must not offend, um, actually arose from the OCD type mentations rather than the opposite way around. Um, so we also have, we've got a number of other things. We've got the kind of guilt that's involved in OCD where you have deep and elaborate um, articulations of different moral categories and, and a deep fear of accidentally um, crossing over a moral boundary. Um, and I think that this is this is very common in OCD too. We have this thing called harm OCD, right, which is a form of OCD where people are deeply afraid of harming others or sometimes themselves, right? And they'll go through this kind of convoluted reasoning uh, where they'll be afraid they've done something in the past uh, that, that does constitute harm to others or that they'll lose control of themselves and they'll do something that causes harm to others in the future. And Part of that is moral hypervigilance. People analyze their actions intensely. Now, if you look at religion, right, um, we have this kind of astonishing forms of moral reasoning, some of them quite commendable, others less so. Uh, like, for example, Thomas Aquinas argues that masturbation is worse than murder. <laughs> um, the Talmud says that it's better to be burned alive than to embarrass someone in public. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we've got this kind of deeply intense moral concern in both and the creation of ever more sophisticated and sometimes somewhat tenuous moral categories. Um, and there's, there's actually a lot of evidence that OCD may be in part, at least in a lot of sufferers, a disease of hypermoralism. So a lot of the regions of the brain that are recruited in moral reasoning are recruited, but they're overactivated in OCD. Got it. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's some of the similarities I see. There's others as well. You know, in OCD, you fall. Some people, especially, especially people with quite severe OCD and and some psychotic-like symptoms, might perform little rituals that are designed to um, protect themselves in an almost magical way. Um, obviously, I think there's some continuation of that in, in religion. Um, there's a kind of magical reasoning involved. Um, uh, you know, uh, intuitions of uh, sympathetic effect where you affect something that's similar to one thing and then that affects the thing itself. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a couple of different points I uh, follow up in the essay. Um, but overall, I, I, I want to clarify one thing, which is that um, I think it's very important and, 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 you know, in parts of this, it might have seemed like I was having a dig at either religion or OCD sufferers. And that's that's really not the intention. I, I think that there's like a very interesting confluence. And I don't necessarily think that either OCD or religion has been a negative force in this regard, like religion has been very important in the development of various forms of moral reasoning. Um, so I, like I see it as, as potentially a, like a, a productive working together, um, not as a kind of, you know, ha ha, uh, religion is associated with mental illness or something like that. You know, it, it, it would be easy to read it in that way. And I don't think that's the right approach. Definitely. I, I think that's wise. Um, Mayor, I've got one more big question for you. And this is just this is for my curiosity. Um, why study philosophy? You know, and, and, and it, yeah, just why study philosophy? I guess I'm better at it than other things um, would, would be my main answer. So, you know, I have I've studied political economy. I've studied psychology and I've studied philosophy. And I guess I wasn't bad at any of them, but um, I have a, a certain particular mind 
And it's a kind of mind, I think, that's well suited to blogging. And I think I sort of alluded to this earlier, a mind which is at once interested in deep and precise analysis of certain things, but also kind of dilettantish in another sense, right? And I think that that's the kind of mindset that that works quite well in philosophy, right? You know, philosophers are famously interested in other people's disciplines. And I think philosophers are, um, you know, sad to say, but it's kind of true that they're, they're epistemic boundary crosses, right? They're people who uh, take an interest in questions that maybe they're not fully qualified to address, but it is, it is good to have people like that, people who um, move around, people who, um, people who challenge ideas, maybe sometimes in a, maybe sometimes in a way that's a little bit ill-formed, but I think it's better to have people doing that than not have people doing that. And I guess that's why I got into philosophy. Um, yeah, that weird combination of, of dilettantism with precision. That, that, that suits particularly analytic philosophy so well. Yeah, I mean, the other thing about it is that you'll never be bored um, for much the same reason, which is that you can use it as a lens to, to study anything or to question anything. Um, I can, you know, I mean, it's, the psychology is a huge subject, for example, and it's hard right. to imagine getting bored of it, but I can sort of imagine getting bored of it, right? Right. Whereas philosophy, I mean, how could you possibly get bored of philosophy, right? You can always just start on another topic or question that's completely different from the first one. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I guess that's my answer. Um, but it, it it is a great question and, you know, it's funny. As you asked it, I realized that I'd never actually pondered it before. Um, I did I did once write, um, so I have a I have somewhat complex life history because of my mental illness. Um, this isn't my first time attempting a PhD. Um, I uh, dropped out of a PhD once previously. And when I was dropping out of my PhD, um, I wrote to my supervisor and I explained that I had mental illness problems and that was part of why I was dropping out. Um, but um, I also said, look, one of the other factors is that I've been, I've been thinking a lot about Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerberg, which is uh, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. And um, I guess that's the only time I'd previously grappled with that question because I've been bothered by this sense that philosophy wasn't capable of changing the world. But I think blogging has actually given me a broader perspective on what philosophy can be and philosophy as a style of thinking rather than a subject matter. And it's made me more confident that philosophy can be used to change the world. Definitely. Well, you know, ideas undergird everything we do at some level. Um, yeah. 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 And uh, I, I think it's quite important. Um, well, Philosophy Bear, thank you so much for coming on. Um, where can people find your blog and where should people find the book as well? Okay, so if you can find my blog by searching Philosophy Bear Substack. Um, and then when you go to Philosophy Bear Substack, um, my book will be there. I should also say, by the way, the book because it is just a collection of my uh, previous uh, blog posts, uh, albeit somewhat polished, is free. Um, so if you're kind of bored and you just want something to read, just go to Philosophy Bear Substack. Um, and you know, the pinned post there is a link to my book, uh, which uh, you can download and read for free. The only thing I would ask, uh, you can give donations if you would like, I will use the donations to um, help spread the book further, which I've been doing so far, and, and that's been quite successful. But whether you do or don't donate, I would ask that if you read the book and you get something out of it, you take the time to pass it on to someone else, to share it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, or to send it to a friend. Um, yeah, and finally, I'd like to say thank you for having me. Oh, um, well, 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 thank you for coming on. It's It's been great getting to chat with you and uh, I've enjoyed the blog. Yeah, it's been very challenging, actually. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, all right, you have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Narratives.